Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Danny Spiteri. And I'm David Holmes. According to a report from the Ministry of Justice, approximately 85,000 women are raped in England and Wales every year, and a further 400,000 women are sexually assaulted. Incidents of domestic violence have risen by 7% in the UK. A flash mob was organised in the centre of Oxford by One Billion Rising as a campaign to stop violence against women. Last month, Oxford came together to strike, dance and rise with a flash mob to the song Break the Chain. Donna Mills, organiser of the Oxford event, led the dance demanding an end to violence against women. We are mothers, we are teachers, we are beautiful. One Billion Rising is a global initiative established last year on the 15th V-Day movement. We spoke to Dana Mills, organiser of One Billion Rising in Oxford. The idea of One Billion Rising is a global event in which women and men join forces to protest against violence against women. Um, and the event takes place through uh, artistic uh, um, events, especially dance. I generally believe that people sort of can get out of vulnerable situations, even in very tough circumstances, and I've seen that myself, through uh, art and other sort of methods of self-expression. Events were held worldwide in more than 160 countries. After the flash mob, a street party began in the pouring rain, followed by singing by the Oxford Bells. In the UK, two women a week are killed in domestic violence, and one in five emergency calls are for domestic abuse. Our motivation today is that we think this is such a cool cause and it's being, I mean, we're expressing the power of women through song and dance. Like, could you get any more exciting? And it's like worth, you know, coming out in the wind and the rain just to like celebrate that. And it's just been so much fun and um, we're really glad we took part. Yeah. I think without small steps, you, you make no progress. I, mean, I just think I just think it's so important. I mean, you could say like, oh, there's a you know, there's only what ten of us singing, and but like if ten of us sang in every town square across the country, that'd be hundreds and hundreds of people. So Even a billion people. A billion people, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we asked people what they think of the increasing violence against women in the UK. I don't think it's increasing. I think what's increasing is our awareness of it, which is actually a really positive thing. And I think the reason that it's becoming more and more of a big deal is because the instances are increasingly isolated because we. We are more aware we are cracking down. The problem is in the education of the people. Uh, people has to understand that we are um, the same, uh, men and women, and the rights are the same. It's not good. <laughs> we, I mean, um, women should stand up for themselves, speak for themselves. More flash mobs. More flash mobs. <laughs> Uh, I think it is just about raising awareness. Perhaps something like a flash mob might be a good idea. Um, because if people, I think if more people knew that it was rising in that kind of level, they might want to be, do more to stop it, really. One billion. One billion rising began as a call to action based on the staggering UN statistic that one in three women on the planet will be beaten or raped during her lifetime. With the world population at seven billion, this adds up to more than one billion women and girls. One billion rising. A great number of Oxford residents complain that potholes in the road are damaging their cars and posing a water hazard to pedestrians. Oxford City Council recently organised a campaign to raise awareness of this issue. Potholes on the road seems to be a common problem that has existed in a number of cities worldwide. Oxford has also experienced the same issue. Although Oxford City Council paid increasingly amount of money on potholes fixing these years, the pothole issue still has not been completely resolved for a long time. On March 1st, City Council invited public members to join a walk-up protest regarding the conditions on the London Road. 
We have interviewed some local residents to collect their opinions concerning the potholes issue. I wrote to the council uh, in May two years ago and they told me that uh, they were doing what they could and filling in the potholes as they rose and I said well why don't you resurface the whole road but they haven't done it and they just keep putting it off and off and off and it's a disgrace. And the bus came and sprayed me with water all over in new suit and um, it, in cars and buses it's just so uncomfortable. And it's time that the council sorts this out now and hopefully today we'll have embarrassed a few people on the council into action and to sort out the terrible state of this road. In addition, we have interviewed Councillor Ross and Councillor Roos, the organiser of this protest, in order to give us a demonstration concerning this issue. Yeah, the county council um, has to decide how to spend its money and at the moment it's got real financial problems. Um, so it's not spending as much money on pothole repair as it needs to and what they're doing is they're putting in temporary uh, solutions and when they repair the potholes it only stays repaired for about one two months and then it all falls out again so it's it, they need more money to do them properly and that's been going on for two three years now because it's a question of priorities and how money is spent at county level um, they've decided to spend money on putting a new roundabout changes in in Kennington Road roundabout Abingdon Road some of you will know that particular roundabout works been going on there a long time I would argue that money needs to be spent on rebuilding the London Road, not just resurfacing it. At this stage, we know that budget priority caused the potholes has still existed. Here we appeal that City Council could promote the budget priority of potholes in order to solve this issue. Brooks TV reports. The Diamond Grant has a history of supporting small and struggling charities. This year, a youth mentoring charity in Blackbird Leeds won this great grant. As one of the most deprived areas in the city, Blackbird Leeds has over 3,000 young people, half of which need support with education and career possibilities. Our reporter Ellen found out more. The Leeds Youth Programme recently won a 5,000 diamond grant to support its youth service. Every year, more than 450 local young people who are less fortunate get together on a number of sports and creative activities run by the youth charity every day. Pool club is one of the activities they most enjoy. But how do these social events really make a difference in young people's lives? My mates were telling me to come play pool. I was like, okay. I came and joined. They say I need to get out the house more. So yeah, it's, it's a place. It's a good place to come. From Monday to Friday, we work every every evening, and also we work during the daytime at Oxford Academy School, where we mentor young people. So many times, parents were thankful and grateful for what we do. Changed my life dramatically. It's really helped me to kind of be more focused. Um, and actually be myself as well. Um, it's helped me to be part of a family. Um, it's given me a job um, that's flexible, that's enjoyable. You know, not, not many people can get paid for doing something they really enjoy doing. As well as that, I get to be a social worker as well. So it works really well for me and my family. Rachel Kubruk, the project leader of the youth charity, tell us how the ground would be used and how the charity would help more young people in the future. So when we get grants, it means that we can start new clubs and work with more young people. So that grant will allow us to work with another 160 young people over a year, which we wouldn't have been able to work with otherwise. So that's, that's, that's the importance of these grants. It's not that the charity is going to uh, go bankrupt and fold. It's more actually that it actually gives us opportunity to work with even more young people. Because there are 3,000 young people living on Blackbird Lease, about 1,500 of them we would say we want to particularly work with, they'd be from more deprived backgrounds, and at the moment we're working with only 400. So there are 900 more that we'd like to work with. The mentoring project of the Least Youth Programme is helpful but limited. More money is needed to help more young people in the city's deprived areas. This is Jezo for Brooks TV. The long-awaited John Henry Brooks building opened on the 24th of February Students performed a flash mob and took part in a silent disco. Trevor Morgan reports. The John Henry Bruce Building has now been opened for academic activities. 
The Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Janet Peer, was present for the event. The opening event was highlighted with social activities and performances of flash mob, dances, and silent disco. The Oxford Bruce students who participated in the event saw the new development as a source of delight and excitement despite the delays in the opening of the building. I mean, they said the building would open like in December, but then it was December and they said it will open in January. But it's like, I think it's exceeded everyone's expectations. I think I'm proud to say that it was in my time that I saw, you know, the opening of the building and my time that I was able to experience it. It's a very gorgeous, motivating building, I guess. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I've been waiting for so long, so I'm excited. It's finally up and running. Oh, it's really nice, and I think it's sort of time that we had like a nice building to enjoy and study in. It's, it's a lovely place, and uh, we are excited as students that this place is open. The staff also acknowledged this as a dream come true towards a better service delivery. The staff are very, very excited. We've got a team of about uh, 45 people in Student Central. It's the first time that we've all been in the same office together. Uh, we've come from different places around the university and we're really excited about um, being in the same place each other, as each other so that we can more quickly uh, answer students' questions uh, by talking to each other, sharing information and deliver a better student experience. Uh, well, staff at the Career Centre are really excited about moving into the new building, uh, having previously been located over the road on site on the periphery of the university, to come into this fantastic new building with all its uh, facilities is great. Uh, we have a very well resourced career centre, um, so we can support students right from the start of their student journey, right through to graduation and even beyond. This is Trevor Morgan, reporting for Bruce TV. Join us after the break when we will be interviewing two members of Oxford Uni Sexism. And we will also see an interesting report about Muay Thai. See you soon. Welcome back to BTV News. Oxford Uni Sexism is an organised women's campaign. It is an Oxford-based student version of the Everyday Sexism Project. Our reporter Mandy had the opportunity to speak to Sophia Martin Pavlo and Dylan James of Oxford Uni Sexism. What is Oxford Uni Sexism and why do you feel that it's necessary? Um, so Oxford Uni Sexism is a working group um, which is part of a wire group called WOMCAM, a women's campaign, which is basically the main feminist um, society or organisation um, at Oxford University. Um, and we're, we're, we're a small committee that basically based our idea on a project set up by Laura Bates called Everyday Sexism. Um, she set up a forum through which people could send um, stories, whether they were male or female, um, of having experienced sexism coming their way, essentially. Um, and they could do this anonymously and it was a way to kind of get the message out that everyday occurrences that are being normalised as part of behaviour or... Yeah, um, the way things are shouldn't necessarily just be um, accepted. Yeah, it's a safe space for people to contribute their, their tales of mm -hmm. you know, incidents that they, they might consider trivial or minor, um, but they obviously feel that something bad has, has, has yeah. occurred. Well, you chose a website to share these experiences. How do you feel that this promotes the ideas better than other venues that you could have used? Um, well, I mean, obviously, uh, social networking is kind of taking over <laughs> the world um, at the moment. And we, we, we wanted to get the message to um, as many people as possible th on as many. I mean, we don't, we're on Facebook, but we're also on <coughs> Twitter and we're on Tumblr. Um, does that cover up? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we basically want to kind of, you know, publicise what we're doing and people's own personal stories in a way that reaches the widest audience possible. Um. Um, according to the Ministry of Justice, violence against women has increased 7% within England and Wales. What do you think the main cause of this is? I can't personally think of any reasons why the actual rate of violence against women would be um, on the increase, but I think, I hope that, you know, it's being made more 
accessible for women to be able to come forward with um, reporting what's happened to them and that, that would be why the numbers have risen. Uh, one billion rising Oxford will demand an approach towards tackling violence against abuse against women and call for the modernization of compulsory sex and relationship education in British schools. What do you think about this and do you think it will help influence sexism at the university level? Yeah, I think it's an entirely um, a positive uh, initiative. Um, certainly, uh, sex education in, in many schools is lacking um, the relationship aspect. So the kind of the it's it's not it tends to be a biological focus often. So um, I think making people more aware of um, the issues surrounding uh, consent and things like that um, will definitely inc decrease violence against women. Mm -hmm. And also, obviously, we've got, uh, you, you're both a man and a woman. Do you feel that sexism is just for women or against women? Or as a man, do you know that there are other men who are using your website? Um, I think, I mean, primarily the, the main victims of sexism are women still, because we still live in a very male-dominated society. Um, but the same culture affects uh, both genders. I mean, uh, gender norms um, are very restrictive, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, 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 intersectionality is important. So we're also talking about um, you know, the oppression of, of homosexuality and mm -hmm. um, race. I mean, those are all tied in together. What would be your advice for students at Brooks who have been, ex have been victims of sexism? I'm sure that sexism is, is, is as much a problem at Brooks University as at any other university. And so I would just encourage um, students to come forward with their own initiative to come up with perhaps a similar project um, where there is a forum for Brooks students too to to come forward with stories, or if not, they can um, maybe send their stories to somewhere else. That's mm. all we have time for today. Thank you both very much for joining us. No Thank problem. You. Did you know that Oxford is one of the six major research centres on dementia in the UK? Well, despite this, Alzheimer's and dementia still are big issues in Oxfordshire, especially when it comes to detecting the early stages. Adele Dashi investigates the situation. Elizabeth is 90. She suffers of Alzheimer, a type of dementia. She looks after herself and today she is taking part to a session about this illness in Headington. To get information, that's why I've come. And to find out everything I can from my patient's point of view, carer's point of view, because my carer doesn't know what's available. And so I'm here to find out on her behalf as well. Set up by Dementia Action Alliance and other organizations and charities, the event brings together about 30 participants. A small amount which attests the difficulty in informing about an illness still often stigmatized. Today's event is part of the Oxfordshire Dementia Awareness Campaign. Cloward represents Guypost Trust, one of the organising charities. Hopefully we'll raise um, the diagnosis rate, which is one of the things, um, and also about um, providing information and services for people, putting them in touch with the people that they really, really need to be in touch with. It's one of the major um, problems um, for people with dementia and their carers, is not knowing who to talk to, not knowing where to get support. Despite losing his wife three weeks ago, Derek still came today to get their information. I'm still concerned with it because I'm still concerned that other people find the passage through it a bit easier than it is because it isn't easy. Multitudes of booklets and conferences are available today to give an opportunity for those affected by dementia to find answers to their questions. However, a wider public is also in attendance. I mean, we all get older. We all have a bad memory as we get older, but how does one diagnose that it's a bad memory just because you're older, or is it the start of a dementia problem occurring, and that I find slightly confusing. Although the sickness begins to be more in awareness, the early symptoms are still difficult to detect, an observation regretted by Elizabeth as a former neurologist. It would be nice if one could be assessed by somebody who knows what to look for in the early stages so that one would know whether you actually had dementia or not. Marion's mother was diagnosed quite early. For 14 years, Marion took care of her while working as a full-time lecturer at Oxford University. She was named National Ambassador for Caras UK and Caras Champion for Age UK. 
She wrote a book about her experience. Looking after mum was very difficult and I needed some way of um, letting off steam. Have you yourself had experience of this, that just nobody knows what you're going through? What motivated her to look after her mum at home? Love. <laughs> I loved her. Um, I couldn't put her into a home and therefore I had to look after her. And I'm very glad I did so. Um, it, it did change my life completely, but for the better, I think. Um, I mean, I know I'm glad it's finished. I'm glad it's over. Um, but I'm glad I did it as well. Elizabeth left the event with a smile on her face. She was informed about an Alzheimer cafe happening next week. Similar to kickboxing, Muay Thai is a martial art from Thailand growing in popularity across the UK with more and more women practicing the sport. Danny, do you think you would be good at this sport? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'd like to try it at least once. Well, our reporter Eve tried it out to find out more about women in Muay Thai. Muay Thai has exploded in popularity in the UK, especially on the women. Muay Thai will teach you discipline, humility and respect. And it's a way to learn how to defend yourself. Maybe this becomes handy with the increasing amount of violence against women. I'm here with the manager of Oxford Martial Art Academy to find out more about the women in Muay Thai. Uh, this is Phil Fit Gym and Oxford Martial Arts Academy. We had a lot of demand and the environment that we're within, we have, we're, we have mixed cultures. Some people prefer to just train on their own in a, in a ladies area instead of a mixed area. We have actually a lot of women that do the martial arts and it's always to do with self-defense. You know, um, as much as people say it's martial arts, we explain it and they understand it that all of this is part of self-defense and everybody needs it regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. Muay Thai is a combat sport for martial arts of Thailand that uses stand-up striking along with various clinching techniques. This physical and mental discipline, which includes combat on foot, is known as the art of eight limbs. Getting to know the basics of Muay Thai, Brooks TV News was invited to watch a real match, this time between a man and a woman. So much fun and it's good for self-defense and good for fitness can you make that one tighter on the second one the and, and she gets to beat me up basically i like to be hit she him loves, she loves to beat me up because you become more confident with using your body you become more aware of effective moves and i think rather than panic maybe say if you had to defend yourself in the street you'd, you'd hopefully have more confidence to know what to do so yeah definitely um, but luckily I've never really had to think about being attacked um, maybe that's quite naive I don't know but uh, yeah I think definitely I can see how I think you just um, it's a different way of holding yourself like knowing that you know you could block something if, if somebody kicked you or punched you so yeah I suppose <laughs> I, I prefer something that's more active and that's where you can really feel that you're working really hard, which you might be able to do with yoga, I don't know, I've never done it, but I guess I'm just not of that kind of serene mindset. I kind of, I like to get my aggression out in the more active way, maybe. You can call it fighting, but it's a sport and a good discipline. It's getting people healthy and putting them on a different road. Muay Thai might sound more like a cocktail than an ancient martial art from Thailand. But in fact, it's an ancient martial art that's about culture, honor, respect and discipline. It's fitness with meaning, which is empowering. I'm Eve for Brooks TV News. Well, may give that a go myself. Anyway, that's it for this week's show. And remember, you can view all our previous episodes on the Brooks TV YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash Oxford And if you have a story that you want to contact us about, then you can get in touch with us at brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. Thanks for watching. And remember to keep an eye on Brooks TV for the stories that matter to you. Goodbye. Goodbye.